Hello everybody, Jordan here, the PH is silent, and welcome to the carnival. A horrifying circus, a haunted attraction, a spectacle that appears overnight in your village, leaving you with wonder and dread as it disappears a few days later. Welcome to another Ravenloft deep dive on an aspect of Ravenloft, the traveling domain of dread, the carnival. Now the carnival is a traveling, well, carnival that somehow travels across the borders of other domains of dread, whether that dark lord has closed their borders or not. Their leader, owner, or MC of the carnival is Isolde, a mysterious woman who protects her employees. Now this traveling carnival didn't always travel and was originally known as Carnival El Morai. It was located in an unnamed area referred to as the Black Heath. Now this Black Heath separated the Carnival El Morai from the city of El Morai. The quote, freaks of the city were outcast and put into Carnival El Morai, which at this time wasn't really a carnival like a circus, but appeared as a town on the outskirts. The citizens of the city reviled those of carnival and thought of them as subhuman. At the center of all of this is the carnival master who wears the ruby pendant. A cursed pendant of some 400 years in age, it marks the current carnival master. They lead the carnival, but the ruby acts as a funnel for all of the hate the city has for the people of the carnival. So the wearer then also hates the people of the carnival, but being in charge, he becomes kind of a puppet for the city. A carny by the name of the puppet master overthrew the last carnival master only to be presented with the option of becoming the new carnival master or let everybody he cared about die. So he took up the pendant and was soon corrupted by it. Now, more information on this can be found in the novel Carnival of Fear, in which those events are the precursor to the novel itself. Now, 60 years after the Puppet Master's rebellion, Marie the Blind Juggler had a rebellion against the Puppet Master, and the process repeated itself with Marie becoming the new Carnival Master, except one thing. Soon after accepting the pendant, Marie was murdered by her second in command, Hermos. Hermos is a 10 foot tall imposing figure with gangly limbs. And after Marie's murder, the carnival folk fled away from the city and ran into the mists of Ravenloft. They made their way to Darkon and fled that region into Falkovnia where they were attacked by the Falkovnian army. Lost, confused, and in need of help, their salvation came at the hands of Isold. Or Isoldi? Isoldi? Isold. Isold took these people in and formed a new carnival, a, a traveling carnival that would serve to protect and give homes to these unfortunate souls. Isold is technically the dark lord of this, quote, domain, if you can call it that. She doesn't seem to be bound by the rules of Ravenloft as much as the other dark lords, and carnival as a domain isn't really a domain at all. I mean, it exists in other domains of dread, and, and it can travel around. Wherever the carnival is going, mysteriously posters and flyers appear to advertise its arrival. Isolde has been seen leaving the carnival when it sets up for a show. She often disappears, but always returns to her people. At the center of the carnival is Isolde's wagon, which is always at the center and perhaps is the expansion point of the carnival. Wherever her wagon goes, the carnival bubble emanates. Now the Visanti play a role in the carnival as they bring new wagons whenever old ones break down. The carnival currently has 40 wagons that are ready to unpack or pack up at a moment's notice. Six of the wagons are known as lock boxes and are actually steel cages that house seven of Carnival's quote, performers that are too dangerous to roam free. Those seven being the hideous man beast and the six abominations. Now, if you join the carnival, there are but two laws. Number one, do your part. Everyone in the carnival does their fair share. You either perform or you do some other kind of work. You cook food, you paint wagons, you mend banners. Nothing is above the other. All contribute to the carnival. Law number two, do no harm. You might think this means just the folk of the carnival, but you'd be wrong. You hurt no one. 
If you bring harm to a trooper of the carnival, you've broken this law. If you bring harm to anyone under the protection of the carnival, you've broken this law. If you hurt a patron of the carnival, and that somehow comes back to put the carnival in danger, you've broken this law. Your penalty for breaking carnival law? Banishment would be the easiest punishment. However, if you've killed someone, well, there is little hope both within and outside the carnival. The people of the carnival have had a lifetime of abuse and abandonment. For you to disrupt the only good thing in their entire lives, well, you better believe that they'll do anything necessary to allow their peaceful lives to go on. Your life is forfeit. So with that, let's take a look at the troopers, the cast of characters that exist within the carnival. There are many, so I won't go over all of them, but I'll talk about the ones that I found super interesting. The Fates Three. Now these three ladies are Vistani that have become part of the carnival. They are tied to it in a way that the players aren't probably meant to understand or figure out. Three sisters in distinctive face paint, they work as one resembling jesters or mummers, wandering the carnival and interacting with the patrons. The Fates Three can read minds. They can read the minds of those around them, and they use this knowledge to perform small improvised scenes that highlight the ugliness inside a person. Many patrons will wonder in confusion at the performance in front of them while one person runs screaming, seeing his secrets, his pain put on display. Next up, the amazing soulless man. Now this person is a wizard who experimented with mirrors and created magical artifacts. Mirrors are not merely a reflection of light, but a window into the realm of the spirits. Everything has an equivalent in the spirit realm, which is why you see a reflection. Those beings without a soul have no reflections, like vampires. Now your reflection is actually a fetch for your spirit double. The amazing soulless man created magical mirrors that distorted the view of the spiritual realm. Mirrors that show wonders, mirrors that show the flaws in a person. He created one mirror that would show whatever had stood before it exactly one minute earlier. His main work of wonder was a mirror that showed only the best parts of you, a person in their absolute best light. Now the amazing soulless man hoped to exchange himself for his appearance in that mirror so he could be viewed by all as the exemplified beautiful person in the mirror. The spell backfired, and he remained the same, but looking in the mirror, he has no reflection. His beautiful self has left, no longer summoned to the mirror, and what mischief that reflection is getting into, no one knows. Mr. Question, or Mr.? Mr. Question is an act that is kept hidden from most of the other patrons. He resides in a tent behind a curtain and wears refined gentleman clothes. And on stage, there is a rack of porcelain masks, which he wears more than a few. The burning question for the audience is, what is beneath the mask? Surely something hideous, a beast or a monster. Why else wear it? At the end of his performance, he removes the mask, but only for a second. The audience gets to see Mr. Question, who has no ears, yet can hear, no eyes, yet can see, no nose, no mouth, no features of any kind, no hair on his head, a shocking sight to be sure. Now, Isolde picked him up in Dementaloo, and both Mr. Question and Isolde won't say anything about his past or why he's in the carnival. With not much of a personality, he haunts the carnival and silently performs for the patrons. Finally, the hideous man-beast, a fearsome half-man, half-leopard. This creature is actually a were-leopard with a small twist. His form is always this bloodthirsty creature, and it is with the light of the full moon he transforms into his human self. Sane, able to communicate, but soon he'll lose that to the bloodlust. If ever freed, this man-beast stalks the carnival for prey. Apparently, the entire carnival was assaulted by a group of these creatures, and while everyone hid in their wagons, Isolde walked up to the largest and cut off its head. Her sword so fast, nobody realized she had attacked until the head fell to the ground. Most of the were-leopards ran, except one, and she took him into the carnival, caged up as a spectacle for patrons.
The Carnival domain is classified as a domain on page 41 of Carnival in the AD&D Ravenloft supplement. Like every domain, it has a Dark Lord who wields great power within their own domain. The Carnival domain, as I mentioned earlier, appears to be limited to a 300 foot radius from Isolde's wagon. Since the Carnival can move, so can the domain, and it superimposes itself upon other domains. Isolde doesn't seem to be trapped and has left, but perhaps she is only waiting in her wagon. None are very sure. Virtually every master of Ravenloft's dark domains can magically seal the borders of their land. The carnival is not restricted by such obstacles. It can cross closed borders. Now the truth about Isold, and this is truly a secret for dungeon masters, which is why I leave it towards the end of this video. If you are in a carnival game or you do not wish to spoil such knowledge, retreat now. Isold has been characterized as a guardian angel to the carnival people. And that is more or less what she is. Those who have been with the carnival the longest believe I sold to be an angel, an immortal being of great power and limitless good. Now the Dark Lords of Ravenloft see her and feel her presence. She's like a hot knife that cuts her way through the barriers of Ravenloft. This is the way she protects her troopers and goes to domains even when those Dark Lords have sealed their borders. However, the real truth about Isolde? For those who have studied other worlds know her as a greater Aladrin. She wears dark clothing and wields a powerful ornate sword that glows brightly. A crusader of sorts that wishes to destroy evil, she was hunting an incubus when the fiend fled into the domains of dread. She followed knowing that she would never escape, but that she could spend lifetimes hunting evil there. The Incubus, also apparently trapped in Ravenloft, is her main quarry, but she does what she can to help the innocent and punish evildoers in the Domains of Dread. The Dark Powers know of Isolde and seem to taunt and punish her. She may never catch that Incubus, and that is probably her curse. Will Isolde's Carnival be making an appearance in your Dungeons & Dragons game? Links to the second edition Ravenloft material that inspired this video down below. And thank you patrons for keeping the lights on. Thank you for subscribing. And finally, thank you for watching. I hope you all enjoy the car.